I've worked a lot in industry organisations and related service organisations. I've uh, over a 20 year period, both as a CEO of a peak body, then as a CEO of an R&D corporation, and then for the last 13 years advising uh, all sorts of industry groups about um, uh, how to innovate with their organisation, with their business model, with their services. And over that period of time, I've found that I see a lot of patterns there, then I'm going to share a little bit of what I've seen and how, um, and hopefully provoke your thinking a little bit during this session today. Um, my, my first point is that um, when I, the idea of having this session was in around uh, June last year when the launch of Seafood Industry Australia, which was a two-year process to set that organisation up, it hadn't had a peak body in the seafood industry for 10 years. Um, many of the people I spoke with told me with absolute conviction that it was not possible, could never happen, and no one had ever opened their wallet to put money into such a thing. Um, and that there is the board of Seafood Industry Australia, um, which, when it was launched were by Senator Rustin. And during that meeting, during that launch event, I was speaking with uh, some senior people from the department and made the observation that while we talk so much, so much, around how our businesses in the goods side, but farmers and value chain businesses need to innovate, we don't really talk much at all about how the service organisations that cluster around uh, our industries that help accelerate them to be more successful, faster, better, better industries producing better quality products and being more valued by government, by, uh, by the businesses in their industry, by the consumers and by the community. Uh, and that discussion provoked that we, I should come and talk to ABARES and, uh, about this meeting today. So I met uh, Rowan, uh, we found we had, as, as he said, uh, some common thoughts around this issue and um, uh, I was surprised and pleased to hear that some of the th lines of thinking I'm pursuing uh, within ABARES itself is thinking along similar lines around how they can innovate as an organisation. So I've had my first take home message is um, uh, don't, don't assume that innovation is just for the, the farm sector and the value chain businesses. Uh, if we're going to have world-class industry bodies, industries, we need world-class service organisations clustered around them. And by that I mean peak bodies, I mean R&D corporations, uh, cooperative research centres, NRM bodies, all those sort of organisations who are doing what can't easily be done by an individual. No matter how big your business is, some things you can't easily do as an individual. And again, a lot of this is how, what your mindset is and how you look at issues. The way I look at these organisations, I don't see them as doing advocacy. I don't see them as doing R&D. I don't see them as doing marketing. I see them as helping sharp, shape the direction of industries. How, their services are shaping the direction of industries to make them more successful. They're orchestrators of change. They're not just advocacy outfits, they're orchestrators of change. So um, that would be the first point I would make, is that it's, um, it's, not, um, it's not simply about the service that you provide, but the business model that you are using and the vision, the outcome that you're trying to achieve. So if you look at it, you find that the industries themselves, the businesses in an industry, actually don't particularly want advocacy or necessarily R&D or necessarily marketing even. If you're sitting in the shoes of the industry business, they're going, how are what these people doing going to help me make more money? How are what these people doing going to help me save money? So make money might be open markets, save money might be remove red tape. Um, R&D to make me more efficient. How might we protect our, my investment? So that's industry reputation, product reputation. Those are things that, that the businesses, when they're looking at these organisations, that's what they're asking. However, when I found I've worked with a lot of organisations across the sector, and you would like to say, look, they're all right on the edge and they're doing brilliantly, uh, but actually it's a pretty mixed bag, as you would expect. There's um, um, uh, one of the... One of the things I noticed is that, and we heard it today, was to have influence, you really need trusted relationships. And so I was looking at the Edelman Trust Barometer, which looks across the economy, not just in farms, and it says um, 
They trust NGOs, the community, uh, and businesses more than they trust government. In Australia, it's like 48% trust government, trust NGOs, 45 business, 35 government, 31 <laughs> in, uh, in the media. So I would say, more than ever, what businesses in these industries, in the rural industries need, are professional organisations they can really trust. Yet when I look at a lot of the peak bodies, for example, I find they're not actually terribly representative. And you say, well, it's almost like um, taboo to raise those things, but it actually really matters. And often you can find at the heart of a lot of the problems come from how effective the peak bodies are in an industry and, um, and how, who they actually represent. So I find that um, the, uh, it's disturbingly common to see most businesses or most of the value of an industry not actually in membership of a peak body. And um, there's a whole heap of reasons why that may be the case. Uh, one of the CEOs I spoke with some years ago of a peak body was when I asked him, asked them what was happening in their industry and why it was behaving the way it was. And they looked at me with a very serious look on their face and said, look, we represent 20% of the 80% who do 20% of production. And there's a long silence. Okay. So you're saying they're the squeaky wheels? Yeah. So we're actually amplifying. We're at one end of the norm, wrong end of the normal curve. And uh, so, and this is not because we don't have good people or talented people who are committed and passionate in these organisations. I would argue that the business models and that are, are not what they should be to make them be their best. And, they, and you get these sort of parallel conflicts where if you look across the R&D corporations, many of which have moved, not all, most of which have moved into uh, company structures now, in many of those you find that they're actually connected through their membership to be actually more than the representative bodies that they're meant to consult with, which is rather bizarre. You can also imagine the problems it creates if that small, if an industry has a small group that's very vocal and it's act, almost representing a faction within that industry, if they have a, a strong influence over what happens with levy funds or government policy, or they're the ones meant to be combat, combating activist groups out in the market. Think about it. So I think the costs don't, if I left a couple of messages there, I would say, Representative bodies are disproportionately important, more so than you think. They're the touch point for media, for government and other parties, and that's where, where often industries, businesses look to. But many are not part of them anymore. Many businesses are not part of them. Uh, so we assume they're the best people to consult with, and they're not necessarily. Uh, and we assume that perhaps it doesn't cost so much because they are not representative, but it actually does. It can cost a lot. The next point I would make would be that People are not um, unaware that that's a problem. Industry leaders are very aware of the need for their peak bodies to be more, um, more representative, more uh, effective in their services, more progressive, more innovative in how they operate. And they, they know that. And the frustrating thing is many really good people I've worked with have tried unbelievably hard to change the, the arrangements they've got now. And it's way more difficult than you may think. Um, and I, in fact, one of my, um, what I'm talking about, it's a simple diagram when I was doodling to try and understand if, if you don't innovate, you will die. <laughs> uh, unfortunately though, with industry institutions, they don't really die, they, they linger on. So you will find while value chains are, um, consolidating rapidly, sm fewer, larger b businesses are more and more influential or networks that are applying. Often, with, often you'll find within industries the proliferation, that consolidation hasn't occurred and it becomes very difficult to work with. So I find that um, what happens is something like this. I tried to draw it. Five. I tried to draw it and said, look, over and again, when I step back and look over 20 years, and that's me both succeeding and failing in work I've done and watching others and talking to people about what's happening, I see industry leaders recognising that um, we need to change. 
either their members are collapsing or their income's collapsing or it's evident they're not effective. And so they bring in a consulting firm and the consulting firm says, right, let's get some options. Uh, let's get a paper out there and consult. Uh, all very straightforward stuff. Let's, uh, and they tend to engage though, mo the engagement mostly comes from those most satisfied with or most unhappy with the status quo. So you get both ends of the normal curve, but the mainstream sitting there watching it all saying, we've heard this before. Consultants get paid. And what you typically see then is complications emerge. The debate is about the model. It's not about the value to the businesses. It becomes about the model, not the outcomes. Not, and that is, a, that is a huge reason why these uh, processes get stuck. So what you end up typically seeing, and there are many examples of this from our largest and most significant organisations like NFF has tried a number of times, and I've been part of processes with NFF to try and get the changes to, that they desired to occur. You end up with incremental or no change. And then you go around the cycle again. And often that cycle will begin with saying, look, we've got a communication issue, so we get a communication company because we, we, we've got good people, we do good work, people just don't understand. Second time around, they'll go, let's get a big brand in here because if we've got a big brand, again, it's, an, it's a rational approach to making the decision. It doesn't really work. Um, so I would argue that over time in the sector, we've seen a gap open up between the rapid changes impacting on value chains in agriculture and the industry service organisations that cluster around them. They're struggling to keep up. In fact, they would never keep up with the market. The market will always move faster. But surely we could actually try, our ambition should be to try and get very close to where they're at. Um, the second thing is in this area, I would say that people keep trying to settle for incremental improvement, when in fact, in many cases, we know that transformational change is actually what's required. Really sweeping change that modernises, borrows off the digital economy, borrows off what's happening in not-for-profits from the political parties in other parts of the world to apply. Um, but all too often it's getting stuck because um, the processes that people are using to innovate simply don't work. And, uh, the, and there's a number of reasons for that. They tend to be more borrowed from uh, government. They tend to be more borrowed from uh, organisations where you have a board and a CEO and a management who can actually have authority to make a decision. It's a more political process when you're working for, with these things. It's very easy to be critical and you go, well, you can find a lot of the problems. And I thought, well, if I had to quickly summarise and I step back, what would I see as some of the features of organisations, not only in, in agriculture, but in other sectors that are actually being effective um, in the modern economy, 21st century, not only associations, but NGOs, political parties. The structures tend to be networks, not big hierarchical institutes. The focus, and you can see this particularly with uh, associations, where there'll be a focus on problems, but they're really savvy players, they're really impactful ones, they're out there finding clever solutions, they're finding alliances, it's not even getting necessarily into the media. Scale, in the old days it was having big, big was an indicator of how successful you are. Today we're going, look, it's variable, we'll scale up. How do we scale up and down rapidly? We're not going to have lots of bums on seats. Back in the day when we had uh, government controlled markets, then particularly associations would actually see their role to build relationships with the government and influence the government, influence the future of our industry. And so today, the progressive organisations are more about how do we engage whole value change, how do we engage the community, how do we engage governments to be influential. Multi-issues rather than single. Governance, I think you will see if you've particularly worked in a lot of, a lot of agricultural associations and industry groups, Boy, how many committees are there? I think when we set up Australian Pork Limited, we literally had more people on committees than we did, than we did on, um, in the organisations. It was really quite extraordinary. So um, communication, direct and immediate, and more about investment and value rather than just saying, let's have a fighting fund. Let's actually invest in our organisations so that they are effective. So that's a bit of a quick snapshot of um, the lay of the land as I've seen it over the last 20 years, my own experience with what works and what doesn't.